Thank you. Yeah. Um, is to wonder whether or not patients need to stay on therapies long term. And I know this is a question that comes up all the time. It's the most frequent question someone asks after we have just discussed what we need to do to treat their disease is, can I stop my medicine or more accurately, when can I stop my medicine? So here's just an example to give you some ideas. 71-year-old woman diagnosed three years ago with severe Crohn's colitis, clinically severe, endoscopically severe, also has an extra intestinal manifestation. She responded well to adalimumab monotherapy and has stayed on it for the past three years. Colonoscopy six months ago showed complete endoscopic and histologic healing. Adalimumab level was therapeutic. You decided to check it, and there are no anti-drug antibodies. She's an otherwise excellent health and a non-smoker. She and her husband live on a fixed income, and her out-of-pocket costs for the medication are becoming prohibitive, but she's willing to make sacrifices to continue to pay. She wants to know, can I stop my medicine? I'm sure everyone in this room is familiar with this question, and when we don't know about it, it is still an issue for our patients when they get home or after we've given them a prescription. So I'm going to review with you what we've learned and what we know so far about the concept of de-escalation and try to give you some guideposts that will uh, help you in clinical practice. So I created this cartoon a few years ago uh, prior to some of the data that will back this up. But the general principle that I um, have thought a lot about is the concept of inflammatory burden and therapeutic intensity. So you see the two y-axes here. The inflammatory burden in a patient, if you're able to treat them effectively, um, starts out high. And then, of course, as we saw from some of the cartoons from Jean Fred, um, is brought down as the disease is under better control. And the therapeutic intensity in order to do that effectively, represented by the green line there, um, needs to match that or at least be effective in some targeted way. So the induction therapy um, predominantly has continued as maintenance in many of the ways we think about IBD, certainly in the historical approach of stepping up or letting patients determine or declare what therapies they needed to get under the control. And there's a lot of drug or drugs that are needed sometimes to accomplish this. So the question of de-escalation involves the concept that you might be able to de-escalate when the therapeutic uh, de-escalate the therapeutic intensity when the inflammatory burden is lower. And certainly a patient who is under excellent control may represent that. So the idea here would be that your maintenance therapy could be decreased or de-escalated or in some situations um, stopped and the amount of drug used would be less. And then the implication, of course, is not only that, but of course cost cost effectiveness and downstream uh, impacts. So let's think about this together and let's see what the data teach us and what we can learn from what we know now. Now there's a wonderful paper I would refer some of you to if you're interested from the British Medical Journal from over 10 years ago that describes the phases of chronic disease management. And we can think a little bit about the chronic diseases of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis when you think about this. The pretreatment assessment, what's the patient's severity of illness when you meet them, how sick are they and what's their prognosis. The initial titration of a therapy to get them under control or induction. Maintenance therapy over time to keep them well, and remember that maintenance is about prevention of relapse and prevention of complications. It's not about ongoing suppression of the active disease, which you hope will have achieved deeper levels of control. And when patients relapse or lose response, we um, monitor, evaluate, and reestablish control and that's what we call treating a flare or changing our treatment strategies. Now the phase of this that hasn't been discussed as often and which we certainly think a lot about is the one called cessation, the green sphere here. And uh, traditionally, the way we treated IBD was based on we considered ourselves fortunate if the therapy worked and we hoped that the patient stayed well and we didn't have so many good uh, ways to know what was going to happen in the future. But now that we have, and now that we've started using some of our treatments earlier in the treatment algorithm, it certainly is a very important question. There are some examples of de-escalation, a couple of which I will cover um, in my presentation. But there is a study, uh, it was actually a phase 3B study of, uh, called Momentum, 
which showed that you could reduce the dose of 5-ASA if patients had achieved complete remission or response, and I'll show you that in a moment. Of course, traditionally, we've always talked about using steroids as induction agents, but committing patients to steroid-sparing maintenance strategies and withdrawing the steroids. Well, that's de-escalation. And there was lots of interest in whether or not we could withdraw immunosuppressives in patients who are combination therapy with immunomodulators and anti-TNFs, and we'll cover that uh, briefly in a moment. Um, the concept of withdrawing thiopurine monotherapy or withdrawing anti-TNF monotherapy, uh, either to leave the patient on nothing or to downgrade them to a different treatment strategy um, is not recommended currently. And the data continue to demonstrate that many patients have problems with that, but I do want to cover that briefly as I go through the rest of this. So here's your roadmap for considering de-escalation. There's a number of steps, and I go through this with patients all the time. The first one is make sure they're in deep remission. Make sure the disease is under the level of control that you think it is. That also includes making sure the therapy they're on is optimized and doing what you think it should be doing. The second is discussing with the patient the risks of de-escalation, the risk that they may relapse and face another uh, activity of their disease that they may have already suffered through to a great extent, and also the uh, risk that the therapy that they're currently on, which seems to have been working, may not work the second time you go back to it. That's a very real risk, and it's something you definitely should be mentioning to the patient because they may say, oh, well, you know, I was on steroids for a few weeks, and then you put me on this drug, Dr. Rubin, and I'm willing to do that again if I really need it. Um, but the, it's not always true that that works. The third, and very importantly, is having a monitoring strategy. So this is uh, perfectly parallel and dovetailed into the treat-to-target concept, and you've heard about this already. But in the same concept of monitoring to see if you achieve a target is the concept of monitoring to see if you drift away from that target when you change therapy or even in patients on stable maintenance strategies. And the last part is to have a rescue uh, strategy. Know what you're going to do if they relapse. Which therapy will you restart? What will you do if that doesn't work? What risks are you and your patient willing to take? So let's just look at some of the data and give you some um, takeaway messages for how you might incorporate some of this into your practice. Uh, this is this phase 3B open label experience using higher dose 5-ASA. These were patients with mild to moderately active ulcerative colitis who received 4.8 grams of mesalamine. And if they achieved clinical remission, they dropped to 2.4 grams, something that we've been doing for years, something that we were taught years ago we shouldn't do, but we know patients were doing. Um, but the difference here is that uh, we looked at a variety of predictors of whether or not they, could st they would be stable when the dose was uh, reduced like this. The blue bars here are patients who had what was called complete remission, which meant clinical remission and endoscopic healing. And by month 12, those who had achieved mucosal healing in addition to being in clinical remission, not surprisingly, were much more likely to continue doing well when the dose had been reduced. And not surprisingly, those who still had endoscopic activity at the time the dose was uh, reduced had, uh, were much more likely to relapse. So this is um, some data with 5-ASA, which we don't talk about as often in our meetings, but we really should. This is directly from DDW, two nice studies that were presented this year at DDW that answered a question that comes up all the time. By the time a patient needs or has been um, uh, escalated to a biological therapy, and in this case anti-TNFs, do you continue the 5-ASA they were on before? Is there any benefit to combination therapy of 5-ASA with anti-TNF agents? Um, there have been questions about whether there's any true efficacy benefit by having that additional mechanism on board. And second, secondly, people have asked, well, is this chemoprotective? Will it prevent dysplasia? Well, the two studies um, demonstrated similar results. One of them said that there was no additional efficacy by remaining on 5-ASA when you escalated to an anti-TNF agent. And the other one said there was no harm by withdrawing the 5-ASA after you got to the anti-TNF agent. In other words, doesn't seem to be adding very much in terms of efficacy. From the standpoint of chemoprotection, which these studies didn't look at, my general comment is that the, the best way to prevent cancer and IBD is to control the inflammation. The 5-ASA benefit, which may still be real, is very small in that context. So from the standpoint of simplifying patients' regimens, these two large analyses um, suggest you can get them off the 5-ASA when you're on anti-TNF. I hear Siri trying to transcribe my entire lecture. It keeps beeping out there. 
Now, the next one is can you stop immunomodulators when you um, escalate or step up to anti-TNFs? This is an older trial which has been criticized for being underpowered, but I will tell you that in this study from Belgium, they randomized patients who are in combo therapy to continuing their immunomodulator or stopping it, and they looked at the clinical outcome of relapse, and at least in this small study, uh, there was not a difference in withdrawing the, the immunomodulator, in most cases it was a thiopurine, um, compared to continuing it when you got to a patient who was on an anti-TNF. So um, I'll put this with the caveat that it was a small study, but it suggests that by the time someone's stepping up to these other therapies, uh, there may not be benefit of continuing the previous ones they were on. Now that was pre-Sonic. Remember that Sonic changed our world in understanding that combination therapy was superior to monotherapy. But, that, but Sonic was pre-post-hoc Sonic, which suggested that the level of the anti-TNF was actually the most important thing if you wanted to understand whether people would do well when you withdraw uh, an immunomodulator. So let's move on to some of the other data to back all this up. What about a patient who's on monotherapy with a thiopurine, whether they have Crohn's disease on the left or ulcerative colitis on the right, and they're in stable remission clinically, um, and you withdraw the, the therapy and they're on nothing? Well, both of these analyses from uh, Crohn's and UC demonstrate that there are lots of patients who are going to relapse. It, it supports the general principle of not leaving people on nothing, but I'll tell you that in these older studies and analyses, um, there were patients who did fine, but there were not adequate controls for all the other variables we've now learned matter, like was their mucosa healed? How deep was their remission when this happened? What was their real risk of relapse based on their disease phenotype and other prognostic markers? So the data in general um, support that patients should not be on nothing, especially if they're stable on a thiopurine doing well, but there are some patients who seem to get away with that. Um, so when a patient asks you, can I be off my therapy, or they tell us, by the way, I stopped it six months ago and I feel fine, how do you approach that situation? Uh, and how do you have that conversation? Well, fast forward to a study now that was a number of years ago called STORY. This is a study that had patients who were on combo therapy with immunomodulator and anti-TNF. In this case, it was infliximab. In stable clinical remission for at least one year, off steroids for at least six months, they open label stopped infliximab. So they were left on their immunomodulator and they came off infliximab. And what the STORY study demonstrated in over 100 patients or so was that by the end of the first year, half the patients had a clinical relapse. Half did not. So who were these patients? Well, the main message was that the people who relapsed early and during that first year were people who were not in endoscopic remission before they withdrew the infliximab. That should make sense. This is a recurring theme here today. But there were other predictors of who was more likely to relapse in that first year. If the patients were using steroids earlier um, in their history. If they were men more than women. Uh, men seemed to do worse across all parameters in IBD. If they were anemic at the time they had their withdrawal. If they had an elevated CRP or calprotectin. Not a surprise in any of these because we, that means they had active disease when the drug was withdrawn. So the other part of this was the long-term follow-up um, in this study and what happened to the people. Remember the rescue strategy concept. So when people did relapse in that first year or subsequently in the longer-term follow-up of story, what occurred? Well, there was severe failure in 8% of them, and they were all predictable based on their baseline characteristics, meaning they ended up needing surgery or having other complications. The biological therapy, in this case infliximab or adalimumab, was restarted in 72 of them. And of those, um, more than half responded to it, but some did not. You can see 35% were unsuccessful. So if you look carefully, you can understand who those patients might have been. They were people who were not in deep remission prior to the drug being withdrawn. And there was another interesting um, point that was found in the study, which I always point out to them. The people who were more likely to have early relapse, look at the very last bullet point there, were those who had detectable trough infliximab levels when the drug was stopped. In other words, the drug was still present and doing what we thought it should be doing, and we were withdrawing an effective therapy. That goes back to what I mentioned um, regarding the post-hoc sonic analysis. Drug level matters to tell you the drug is present before you withdraw it to know whether it's working or before you withdraw something else.
What about an ulcerative colitis? Oh, I'm sorry, and one more point. One of the nice things about story is how they monitored patients. So getting to this monitoring strategy, they did monthly CRP and monthly calprotectin. And what they found was that calprotectin went up first. This is in Crohn's, by the way. And CRP went up later, but both gave you enough notice within months to predict clinical relapse. So um, using a monitoring strategy of either CRP if your patient makes it, or calprotectin if they have an elevated one in the past and you can rely on it, or scoping them can tell you that the patient's likely to have a problem before they actually get into trouble clinically. So this would suggest that monitoring with these biomarkers may be useful in a, in a withdrawal or de-escalation strategy. And what I thought I was coming to is this, which is what about in ulcerative colitis? So unlike story in which patients were all on combo therapy, this experience, which is a multinational retrospective study, um, looked at patients who had infliximab withdrawn, whether they were on combo or not on combo. And it was a similar result, but the other point here was that the patients who had a reduction in relapse, relapse risk were those who either were left on a thiopurine after infliximab was stopped or who had a thiopurine started when the infliximab was withdrawn. Not that that's necessarily something we would actively encourage you to be doing, but the whole point here was that having something on board was better than having nothing, uh, and that was uh, a similar message for ulcerative colitis as we saw from the Crohn's disease story trial. So the other predictive factors of relapse after discontinuing infliximab and UC, and this is a very nice paper uh, written by both Joanna Torres and Jean-Fred Colombel, was prior anti-TNF course, having elevated inflammatory markers, being anemic, again, men more than women, um, and having the detectable infliximab trough levels. So there's a variety of ways to think about this looking at the available data, but the re recurring theme here is if you have somebody with complex disease who has um, labs that are abnormal, um, men more than women, you should not be encouraging or allowing de-escalation. You should be monitoring and keeping them on their existing therapy. What about the next level? This was done by one of our advanced fellows who's now running an IBD center in Melbourne, Australia, Britt Christensen. Um, we first observed, and, and this goes back a number of years, and Steve, of course, was part of all this and, and had made comments previously to our pathologists, that some of our patients normalized their biopsies. So on biopsies in their surveillance colonoscopies, uh, for UC, their biopsies showed normal tissue. You didn't see the, the specific chronic architectural changes that are typical of ulcerative colitis. Uh, and the question was, can we really normalize histology, or was this a patholo pathology error or even a diagnostic error? Well, we went back and had Britt look at all these things carefully, and in fact, 10% of our long-term UC patients had normal histology. And the nice thing she did was then look at them compared to those who had quiescent histology, so architectural distortion but no active inflammation, and of course those who had active inflammation. And what she demonstrated very nicely was that those who had normalized histology had the best outcomes. They were least likely to relapse over time. So the question, of course, is are people with normal histology people who are the safest to withdraw therapy? And that analysis is going on right now, and hopefully I'll be able to tell you about it. The other group where we de-escalate therapy is someone with Crohn's where they go to surgery, right? How often do they go for an ileocecectomy after we've escalated them all the way up on treatments before we uh, suggest or they agree to have surgery? A lot of times they come out of the OR and they're feeling well and they're not on any treatment. That's a de-escalation strategy. The induction here was surgery, it's surgical induction of remission or surgical remission. Um, this is a nice study, although small, by an um, uh, investigator named Dario Sorrentino, now in Virginia, originally from Italy, as, as you might guess, and uh, th lived in Australia for a while when he actually did this study. And patients who had an ileocecectomy, he did Calpro um, postoperatively, and he actually randomized them to infliximab or mesalamine. Now that's a discussion uh, point we can get into a little bit later, but I wanted to show you here the value of monitoring post-op. First of all, in the first three months post-op, everybody has a calprotectin that's elevated, and that's probably because of the trauma of the surgery. 
But of those who had early relapse of their uh, Crohn's disease, their CalPRO goes right up after those three months. Um, and those who responded to being on infliximab as a post-operative therapy in his study, the CalPRO came right back down. So similar message, monitoring patients after de-escalation can tell you who might need therapy early and then allow you to intervene and then, very importantly, monitor them to know they responded to the therapy. We also had a very nice French scholar who spent nine months with us at the University of Chicago named Anthony Boussan. He runs a, a small IBD unit in France. And Anthony looked at all the CalPro that we've been collecting at our center. And the fecal CalPro um, I'd been using for a long time in a variety of ways, including what I've just described to all of you. And what uh, Anthony found was that in patients in whom we decided to de-escalate one therapy or take them off um, all therapies in some specific situations, having a CalPro more than 100 at the time they were withdrawn from therapy was very predictive of early relapse. So in other words, before we took them off, making sure that they actually are in deep remission was critically important. Being on steroids at the time we withdrew one of their immunomodulators or biologics was a predictor of early relapse, not so surprisingly. But very interestingly as well, and I give Anthony full credit on this, he found that you could use CalPro to predict steroid dependence. So those patients who had an elevated calprotectin while they were on steroids were those who were going to fail you trying to get them off the steroids. So now you can imagine having some additional marker instead of just trying to taper them slower and slower and slower and keep going back up and doing all the things we do. Whatever maintenance therapy you're using, whatever steroid sparing strategy you're using, you can imagine using CalPro as a way to predict the success of that before you go down. And then once you know your CalPro has gone down in the right patients, and remember, it's UC more than Crohn's uh, in terms of how accurate that, therapy, that monitor is, you can then successfully and more rapidly move off steroids. There is an ongoing, uh, quite nice randomized trial that I'll briefly summarize for you called BioCycle. And the bottom line of this very nice stu study of, of de-escalation is they're looking at combination therapy and whether stopping the biologic or stopping the um, immunomodulator uh, is uh, safe, effective, which patients, how should we do it. This is something I know jean fred has been involved in, and we're looking forward to hearing more about this as these data start to percolate and come out for all of us. So I think this is a really critical issue. I know it comes up practically in your uh, patients, uh, and I know this is something we talk about all the time. And we have actually learned quite a bit about how to consider this when you might and how um, and which patients you wouldn't de-escalate. And this biocycle study will tell you a lot. If you want to know more, I refer you to this study by uh, Miles Sparrow and the Bridge Group. Uh, Miles is in Australia now as well, but spent some time both in Chicago and New York in his training. And this was what's called a RAND appropriateness panel. The Bridge Group are a group of investigators who collaborate on questions that are of interest. And in this particular case, they did a, a, a thorough literature review, and they asked the group, would it be appropriate or inappropriate to de-escalate in this situation? And they tried to go through all the different scenarios. Um, you can see uncomplicated Crohn's disease on the left, which is the major um, uh, columns there, and then complicated Crohn's on the right, and then they went through a few other um, different parameters, like whether they are on combo therapy, monotherapy, and they asked the group, based on the review of the literature, is it uh, appropriate or inappropriate to de-escalate? So if you want some more concrete guidance here, I'd refer you to Miles Paper or the Bridge IBD website, which is there, and you can see that in general, for your complex Crohn's, de-escalation was thought by the group to be not recommended, not appropriate. And it, uh, you, I think you understand why. Um, by the time we get them under control in complex disease, it's a group that we feel uh, uncomfortable with drawing. So my very last point here is can you go back to an anti-TNF safely after you've stopped it or after the patient stopped it or after they've had surgery and been off of it or after insurance has delayed them getting uh, back on it. And in fact, there are an accumulated number of studies to tell us that the dogma that you can never go back um, is actually not true. There are patients in whom restarting their anti-TNF can be safe and effective. And I'll just uh, show you that it's in both infliximab and adalimumab where this has been done. I think one of the most um, Helpful studies was this one from the Belgian group, Philippe Bert and the colleagues there, um, specifically looking at success of restarting infliximab after a drug holiday. And I'll highlight for you that um, knowing what the uh, post-loading dose, uh, first dose infliximab level is, 
was predictive of success in going forward. So after someone had a drug holiday, reloading them, you could predict the likelihood of them doing okay or having a hypersensitivity reaction based on a level right after that first dose. And what was predictive of successful restarting of the infliximab in this analysis was being on an immunomodulator at the time they were on the infliximab the first time. In other words, something that protected them from developing antibodies initially and presumably protects them from um, developing them when they restart the drug was very important. So this is my last slide. It's uh, the algorithm we've been using in Chicago. It's sort of modified from some of these studies, but specifically Philippe's nice study, um, where we looked at our patients, uh, and we've been doing this now for a number. People have had more than a six-month drug holiday with infliximab or adalimumab, where they were off the drug not because they developed, of course, antibodies to the drug, but for other reasons. If we need to go back to it, we do um, a restart of one infusion, with pre-meds, and a week later we check uh, the drug level and antibodies. If there are no antibodies and plenty of drug present, we proceed with the second loading dose, usually at week two or three, practically speaking, and we can move forward and they likely will do well. On the other hand, if the drug is undetectable and they already have antibodies after one re-exposure, it suggests an amnestic immune response and you should not proceed uh, and you would uh, likely have an infusion reaction. So this is a thoughtful way to restart when we've needed to. So this is my summary slide. I hope that you've taken away some um, practical points to think about in whom you may consider de-escalation, how you must know about deep remission as well as the um, monitoring strategy you're going to use for each patient and the patients, very importantly, in whom this would not be appropriate and who you should specifically be advising against it. So I'll stop there and I'll be happy to introduce our next speaker.